ask you if you're on this campus or on any of our campuses in the East Worship Center or our Lockport campus or Cheektowaga campus, if you are physically able and can get on your knees, I'd ask you to do that. So, Father, we want to begin our time together today by confessing our deep need of you. There is nothing and no one that we need more than you. With everything that we are, God, we want to lay ourselves at your mercy and rest in your grace. Because you are Father, you can be trusted. And Father, I pray that whatever scheme of the enemy to try and confuse or twist the minds of people through the course of a week, to try and trick us into thinking that we can be satisfied with other things and that you alone are not our satisfaction, I pray that you would, even now, in every expression of the chapel, in every place, that in the name of Jesus, the enemy would be bound. From this place, from the hearts and minds of people, that you would give clarity and that you would restore in our hearts a sense of awe for who you are. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for where we, where we have other things, idols, that we put in place of you, where we trust in other things, where we find ourselves prayerless during the course of a week, or we find ourselves praying, but we are centered, our attention is centered only on trying to figure out what we can get from you. You're so good and you're so gracious to give us what you give us, but Father, I pray that we would love you for you and that whatever it is, God, that you're asking of us and that you call us to, that we would, that we would yield to that willfully and gladly, knowing that you are good. And we pray, Father, for people that are around us in our neighborhoods and in our places of business and in our schools and in our community that need to know you. And I pray that they would be able to see you clearly in us, that we would have opportunities more and more to be able to demonstrate the gospel of grace and that we would also have opportunities to communicate the gospel of grace in those relationships. And I pray you'd speak to us today, God. We have much to learn from you. And I pray today, God, as we spend time in your word, that you would speak truth into our hearts, that we would be receptive, that you would prepare our hearts in such a way that it would be fertile ground so that the seed of your word might might be planted and take root and grow and bear fruit in our lives. So we trust you to do that in this day. We thank you for the glory of who you are and how you've demonstrated your grace to the world in the gift of Jesus on our behalf. Praying all of this in his name. Amen. So while you're taking your seats again and trying to get yourself resituated since I kind of messed you up a little bit, um, in the mid-1930s or so, 
There was a king of the British Commonwealth, George V, and he was ruling and carrying on until his death in 1936. And so the assumption was that in 1936 that his oldest son, Edward VIII, uh, would take over for him and have the opportunity to lead the Commonwealth, and he did. Uh, the struggle was is that Edward VIII wanted to marry an American socialite who had been divorced, and that was frowned upon if you were the British king, and he decided he would rather vacate the throne and marry this divorced American socialite than to remain as the king, and so he did that. Well, that left a vacancy, and <clears throat> it was to be filled by uh, Edward's younger brother, George VI. Now, the problem was George VI was never intending to be a king. He didn't really want to be, and he felt ill-equipped to be a king. And maybe some of you who know your history or you've watched movies, um, you know that he also had a huge problem. He was a stammerer, bad stammerer. And so it was somewhat painfully ironic that in that time, the technology had been created uh, in radio and in broadcasting where now you could, as a leader of a nation, you could actually broadcast your voice all over the world. That seemed to be painfully ironic since, you know, George VI was now coming into power and he couldn't talk very well. The other painfully ironic thing about this is that the technology was not yet invented where you could pre-record what your message was going to be and maybe massage it and edit it a little bit. No, this was going to be straight out and that was a tough, tough scenario for him. So he found uh, someone named Lionel Logue who was an Australian uh, speech therapist who was very unorthodox in his ways and even had his education in some other uh, arenas other than just speech therapy. And he began to work with the king. And over and over and over, and if you've seen the movie, the king really didn't stammer much when he was cussing. <laughs> but um, so he figured he couldn't cuss all the time when he did public addresses. And so the goal of Lionel Logue was to teach him how to speak like a king, specifically how to speak like a king in the greatest times of pressure. Because ultimately... Um, King George was going to have to communicate to his nation about the impending world war that was about to happen. And the Nazis themselves would make fun of King George and call him that stammering king, and they would basically treat him like he was a joke. And so he had to go on and broadcast to not only his people, but really uh, even allied forces in the world that could access him and be able to reassure them and speak to them in a way that was reasonably clear. And so Lionel Logue's job was to help him do that. And eventually, as you know, he helped him learn how to speak like a king, even when the pressure was the greatest. So today, when we are looking at the king's last week, we're in Mark chapter number 14, where we have been the last couple of weeks and where we will remain in the next couple of weeks. And in Mark chapter 14, what we see is we see how a king speaks when he's under his greatest pressure. We see how a king prays when he's under the greatest pressure imaginable. And so I want you to look with me in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse number 32, and it says this. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Now, you know what is progressing here. This is just after Passover that we talked about last week. And after the time of Passover, they left and they crossed the Kidron Valley because they were taking and eating the Passover in the city of Jerusalem. But then they crossed back uh, over or through the Kidron Valley to the base of the Mount of Olives. And there toward the base of the Mount of Olives is a, a place, a garden that is familiar to Jesus and his disciples. And it's a, a garden that's called Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane is aptly named 
Because what the word means, Gethsemane, is olive press. It is the place where olives get crushed. This is what it means, Gethsemane. Olive press or olive crushing. And if you were ever on the Mount of Olives, I've been there a number of times, some of you here have been with me. If you're ever on the Mount of Olives, you see that there's a reason it's called the Mount of Olives. Because there's a lot of olive trees. That's why it's the Mount of Olives. And so this place, Gethsemane, was a, a place where they would go to pray. And Jesus took his disciples with him to a place that was probably, in some way, at least a little bit, maybe fenced off. And he took all of his disciples with him to kind of the beginning or the gate of this place. And there he leaves them, except for three that he brings with him inside of the garden, Peter, James, and John. Now, I think it's interesting that Peter, James, and John have the opportunity to come with Jesus into this place because there are a few times recorded in the book of Mark where Peter, James, and John get an opportunity to go with Jesus. And I've, I've heard it said before by many people at many different times that Jesus does not have favorites, but he does have intimates. Now, I would say that that's probably true in part, but I would also say that part of the reason that Peter, James, and John came with Jesus may not have been simply because they were intimates, but could have also possibly been, and I say this with all due respect, because they were knuckleheads. That they needed some after-school tutoring. You, you know those people, right? You, you see the potential in them. Maybe, maybe they're uh, people that you coach in a, on a ball team or they're uh, people in a dance troupe that you're leading or uh, whatever. Maybe they're students and they, you just know that they need a little bit more attention and they've got all the potential in the world to do a variety of things. I think that may have been what was going on here with Peter, James, and John. Because I, I'm confident that what Jesus is doing in bringing them with him is trying to help continue teach them a little bit because they just aren't quite getting it. It wasn't just that he favored them. It was that they needed to learn some things because they were going to be used in great ways. And if you just think back within the last set of hours prior to this time frame, you would understand maybe why Jesus is bringing these three guys, Peter, James, and John, with him further on into the Garden of Gethsemane because he wanted to help them get it a little bit more. You remember James and John just not, not many hours before this time in uh, Mark chapter number 10 saying these words. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Oh, we can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So James and John ask this very bold question of Jesus, and Jesus is trying to help them understand that they don't quite get it. They don't quite know what they're asking. They don't quite understand what it means to be baptized with the baptism that Jesus is about to be baptized with, to drink from the same cup. They don't quite understand that. And so what is Jesus doing? Jesus is bringing them into the Garden of Gethsemane to hear what it sounds like when a king prays even from a distance, to hear a little bit about what it looks like with Jesus and what he is about to walk through and what he is about to go through, and he brings them with him. And you know, Peter, he didn't quite understand fully what was going to happen either. In fact, quite literally right before they went over and they left the time of the Passover and they went across the Kidron Valley into Gethsemane, notice the conversation that Jesus and Peter had in Mark, four, uh, Mark 14. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. 
Peter didn't quite get it either because he didn't fully understand or comprehend what was about to transpire. And isn't it interesting that when we come face to face with death, it makes cowards of us all, doesn't it? And James and John and, and Peter were now having to come with Jesus into these contexts. And there were other times, by the way, the two other times other than this time that Mark relates Peter, James, and John coming with Jesus somewhere by themselves, both of them had to do with death, just like this will. In fact, one was in chapter 5 at the, the death of Jairus' daughter. And Jesus brought Peter, James, and John with him alone into that place to see what he was going to do with this dead girl that he was going to raise up because he was going to help teach them something. And the other was in Mark chapter 9 where the transfiguration was happening and Jesus was there with Moses and Elijah. And we find out from some of the other gospel writers that what they were talking about is they were talking about the day of Jesus' death. And so the three times, Jairus' daughter, transfiguration, and Gethsemane, the three times Mark relates Peter, James, and John coming with Jesus, it all circles somehow around death and even somehow represents new life. He was trying to help them understand the nature of his kingdom. And even in this, his most pressure-filled, most stress-filled moment where he is coming into the garden... He is still endeavoring to try and teach these men so that they will get it, so that they can be used of God. Aren't you glad that even in Jesus, what seems like Jesus' weakest moments, he still has the power to be able to bring us along and help us? Even when we're knuckleheads, I know I'm not talking about any of you, but even when we're knuckleheads like me, when sometimes we just don't get it, sometimes he tries to tell us over and over and over again. If you start flipping through the Gospels and see how many times Jesus said he was going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men and that he was going to die and that he was going to rise from the dead and it just wasn't registering for these guys and Jesus still continues to help them in this process, aren't you glad that he's that kind of king? That he's the kind of king that takes us even in our knuckleheadedness and loves us in the midst of it and brings us along in the midst of it and helps us in the midst of it. I'm glad that I don't have to get it all the way right every single time. Sometimes I get C minuses on the test and the king still loves me and helps me and brings me along because he sees things that I can't see. He knows things that I don't know. This is the kind of king we're talking about here. It's a beautiful picture. And then he brings them in there and he walks further away from them and goes alone. Not with them. He goes alone. And by the way, when he left all of the disciples at the gate, you notice that he didn't ask them to pray for him. He didn't say, pray for me. He was about to go do what he was going to do alone. He just said, stay here, sit here. And then he leaves Peter, James, and John when they had come in with him, and he goes in a little further. He confesses to them how deeply distressed his soul is that is so overwhelming that he feels like death is knocking at his door. And then he says to them, you stay here and keep watch. And he goes a little bit further. And we get an opportunity to see what a king talks like in the greatest moments of pressure. The first thing I see is this, is that the king prays a humble prayer. Look what it says in verse number 35, in the beginning portion of verse 36. It says, going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if, it, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Do you see the humility in Jesus? Isn't it striking to you that when he goes a little bit farther away, the disciples he left at the gate, the, the, the rest of them, the three he left inside, and he goes further away from them, and I don't know if they can hear him, but I'm guessing that they can. I've been in that area of Gethsemane before, and I don't know how far away he went, but it says going a little farther, he fell to the ground. That struck me distinctly. Jesus got on his face on the ground at the base of Mount Olivet when he began to pray. He was humbling himself, prostrating himself before his father. And it's striking to me because this is the word made flesh. 
And the scripture says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. That Jesus was there from the beginning and he was the creative force of making the very earth that he was laying on. That the earth that now was supposed to be in creation, his footstool, was now his altar. That the very ground he had formed with his own hands and carried the earth in his own hands, now he has laid himself upon it and it became a cradle that was holding him. This is the son of almighty God laying prostrate before the father. This is humility. And in his humility, he calls out Abba, which means father, or maybe if you wanted to say it colloquially, it would mean daddy. This is a son crying out to his father, noting that everything is possible for him, but he is He is reminding himself and reminding his father of the intimacy of their union. And he is literally positioning himself where he has cast himself face first on the mercy and grace of his father that he loves. This is an incredible picture of intimacy. You see, when Jesus, the son of God, can throw himself on the mercy of the father... Trusting the Father in the midst of that, it should be a reminder of, uh, for us. Because this is, what, this is what Jesus does, listen, in childlike faith, not childish faith. Childlike faith, he casts himself on his Father. You know, when, when Trace, my, who's my oldest now, and who's six, two and a half now, so I hope he doesn't do what I'm about to explain to you. When he was like three... We were um, in Florida at the time, and we had, a, we had a stage, you know, in a place where we ministered and preached and all that stuff, and it, it, I don't know, it's probably similar in height as this one, I guess, maybe a little shorter, I don't know. And Trace is a three-year-old, you know, we, right, we had little kids, we're pastors, we're, we're around the joint all the time, right? We're like the last people out of the building half the time, you know, after a worship gathering and all of that stuff. And Trace, you know, once Edie would go get them finally out of the, the nursery area and the kids' area, they would come. I would always know when he would come into the worship center after, you know, services are done and we're just kind of hanging out talking with people, but I would just hear this, <laughs> these feet, man, just flying because it was all brick pavers on the side. And then and it was just all open and I would just hear, he'd be flying and I would just be like, yeah, that's my kid. I know it. And I just hope he doesn't attack me while I'm in the middle of you know, praying with somebody and he just crashes into my leg. It happened all the time. And he would come and he would run up on the stage. And one of his favorite things to do was quite literally to just go, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and just leap. And I would catch him and then he would put him down and he would run up the steps and then he would just leap just like this. The problem was, is that many times, many times, I would be talking to someone, he would get away from me, he would take off and jump and mid-flight yell, Daddy! (laughs) Mid-flight, to which I would turn and do this number, right? And I would catch him most of the time. (laughs) You know what that was a picture of? Humility. Humility is not just about putting our head in the sand and groveling and doing all. That's not. Humility is actually a complete and total dependence. And that's exactly what my son would do. He would, he would leap off without me even looking in trust that when he called my name, I would turn and I would catch him. And I did. Most of the time. (laughs) But Jesus is so confident in his father that he lays himself prostrate before him and he is calling out with a name that is unique because ultimately the Jews themselves did not use this kind of term when they spoke to Yahweh. And Jesus uses a unique term in speaking to Yahweh by calling him daddy. 
Father. There is an intimacy and there is a deep humility when the king begins to speak and the king begins to pray. But he also prays a scripture-soaked prayer. I don't want to lose you here, and if you're a note-taker, you're going to be writing uh, reasonably feverishly, I think. But what Jesus says in the next verse is so rich and so soaked with Scripture that it's hard to even capture it all. Listen to what he says in verse 36. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. You see, we listen to this sometimes, and we know the words of what Jesus is saying, but I want to remind you that the king, who is praying a very humble prayer, who is praying to his daddy, who is prostrate, laying on the ground that he created with his own hand, who is laying on that ground, calling out to his father, that when he speaks, that when he prays, it is so soaked in the reality of the scripture. It is soaked in it. In fact, the first thing that he says is he says, everything is possible for you. Everything is possible. What is he referring to? Well, uh, he very well may be referring to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse number 17. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. He knew that his father, God himself, that nothing is too hard, nothing is impossible. I wonder if his mind even ran back to the reality of the incarnation at the time of the angels appearing to Mary. In Luke chapter number one, it says, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. That is also translated, nothing is impossible with God. You see, Jesus is reminding himself when he says everything is possible for you. He is relating back what is coming out of his heart and coming out of his mind when the king begins to speak. is soaked in the reality of the revelation of God that's given to us in the scripture. But then he says these words. Take this cup from me. Now, not only was Jesus referring to what we looked at last week in the book of Exodus where it talks about the third cup of redemption. He's just come out of the Passover meal, right? And and he has said about that third cup that this is the third cup of redemption. And you do realize that redemption has a costly price. And Jesus is saying... If you could take this cup from me. He's not only talking about this cup of redemption, he's talking about this cup that the Old Testament recognizes as the cup of wrath and that ultimately for Jesus to fulfill redemption means that he has to drink the cup of God's wrath. This is what he's referring to. In fact, listen to how Ezekiel recognizes this cup. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You will drink your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. It will bring scorn and derision for it holds so much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow and the cup of ruin and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it dry and chew on its pieces and you will tear your breasts. I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. It is a cup that is recognized through the course of the Old Testament as a cup of wrath, and Jesus recognizes he's about to have to take this cup. But what he says is, if you could take this cup from me. Do you realize that that is also rooted in Scripture because there has been a time recorded in the Scripture where the nation of Israel was given the cup of God's wrath to drink, but God removed the cup from them? This is in Isaiah chapter number 51. Therefore, hear this, you afflicted one, made drunk, but not with wine. This is what your sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. 
from that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. You see, Jesus is actually referring to the scripture. His prayer is so soaked in the scripture that he is saying, take this cup from me. I know that this is the cup of redemption. I know redemption has a heavy cost. I know that this is the cup of your wrath. But if it is possible, like it has been before, if there's any other way to accomplish this, maintaining your glory, but if there's any other way to accomplish this, Father, take it from me. But then he says these words, yet not what I will. Now, I need you to understand something here. Jesus in this moment, I believe, is in the most intense battle with the enemy right now, right in this moment. And I believe that those words are directed actually at Satan himself. Jesus does not have a sin nature. Jesus is different than us in that we have a war that goes on inside of our flesh, our fallenness that Jesus did not have. Yet Jesus was tempted as we are, but was without sin. The temptation was oh so real, but it was not calling out to his fallenness because he didn't experience fallenness. So where was his temptation coming from? It was coming from the enemy himself. You remember in the desert, in the wilderness, where he is being tempted over and over and over again in his physical weakness, having not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, in his fasting and physical weakness, the enemy is coming to try and tempt him. But Jesus fulfills the test. And here he is saying, if there is any other way for this cup of wrath, this cup of redemption, if there's any other way to do this other than this, then could it be, but yet not what I will. I believe in that moment he was calling out and it was echoing in the heavens saying, Satan, I will not fail. And I'll tell you why, because when he uses these words, yet not what I will, he is actually quoting from the book of Isaiah where the chronicle comes of the fall of the enemy and listen to the words. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you once who laid low the nations. You said in your heart, listen to it, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And Jesus says, not what I will. I surrender myself to the Most High God. I am not going to subvert the power of Almighty God because he knows better. Someone has already tried to do that, the enemy of our souls. And he says, yet not what I will. Satan, I will not give in to my own will. This is a scripture-soaked prayer. And then he says, if you're a guest, I get like this on occasion. Then he says these words, yet not what I will, but what you will, but what you will. You see, here's what Jesus knew. He knew that it was the will of God for him to be crushed. Listen to how Isaiah prophesied this in Isaiah 53, talking about the suffering servant. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. You see, here's what Jesus knew. He knew that it was the will of God. And so he said, not what I will. 
as Satan had already established his own will, not like him, but what you will, Father, because I trust you. You see, Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the big story of redemption, the whole story of history was being played out in these moments. And it was really a tale of two gardens. It was the Garden of Eden where man had fallen. And in this garden, Eden, by the way, means delight or pleasure or blessing. You had Eden, the Garden of Blessing, and you have Gethsemane, the Garden of Crushing. And this is where all of history is being played out because Jesus now comes as the new, the second Adam to restore what was lost in the beginning. You see, in the Garden of Blessing, the first Adam faced the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but surrendered to the plot of Satan. But in the Garden of Crushing, the second Adam, Jesus, faced the tree of Calvary and surrendered to the will of God. In the Garden of Blessing, the first Adam asserted his own will to the ruin of the human race. But in the Garden of Crushing, the second Adam abandoned his own will for the redemption of the human race. In the Garden of Blessing, the first Adam rebelled and made an effort to make his own crown. But in the Garden of Crushing, the second Adam, King Jesus, put down his crown for a cross. You see, this is what Jesus knew when he was praying his prayer. It was a scripture-soaked prayer because he saw the activity and the history of God being played out in these moments. And, and I don't want you to forget about the fact of where they had just come from, by the way. The reason this was also scripture-soaked, his prayer, is because where they had just come from, the Passover meal. You remember that. And if you remember when they were leaving, you feel like it's a throwaway verse at the end of the Passover meal after you hear the description in Mark chapter 14. Listen to what it says, verse number 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You kind of go, okay, I guess that's the end of the service. They sing a hymn and then they go out to the Mount of Olives. Well, do you know what they were singing? They were singing the Hallel Psalms. This is what you sang after the Passover meal. You would sing the end of the Hallel songs. So we would be talking about Psalm 116, 117, 118. Let me give you a sampling of what was on Jesus' lips when he was going to the Garden of Gethsemane. Psalm 116 says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice and he heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me, and the anguish of the grave came over me, and I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. This is what he's, he's singing about in Psalm 116 as he's making his way to the garden. And then Psalm 117 sings the whole psalm. It's very short. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And then in Psalm 118, these words, when hard pressed, I cried out to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. This is what was on the king's lips when he walked into the garden of Gethsemane. His prayer was soaked in scripture. And ladies and gentlemen, ours must be too. Ours must be too. It's not enough, ladies and gentlemen, just to know it. It's not enough just to be able to quote it. It's not enough just to be able to teach it as a principle. We must willingly give ourselves gladly to it. 
When we get squeezed, what comes out? When Jesus gets squeezed, the speech that comes out of his mouth, the prayer that comes out of his mouth is a humble prayer that is soaked in Scripture. Even in such a dark time, and I'm reminded of Spurgeon's statement when he said, when you can't trace his hand, you can trust his heart. This is what God says to us. A reminder to us that even in these moments, Jesus was trusting the heart of God. So he prays a a humble prayer and a scripture-soaked prayer, but it's also a watchful prayer. Look in verse 37. It says, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus in this moment was watching and praying. But Peter, James, and John, they weren't. And he specifically calls out Peter because he is now showing Peter a real life example of what he was trying to teach him about just hours ago. Jesus, as I've told you many times, he he teaches us something in somewhat of a parable form, and then he gives us real life opportunity to experience it like the disciples. And in this moment, he had told a parable just hours and hours and hours before, and he was relating it ultimately to his return, which we would relate it, but he was also making something very clear to Peter. Listen to what it says just in one chapter back, Mark 13. He said, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Did you catch that? And now he tells Peter, you're sleeping. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. What temptation is Peter about to fall into? Multiples. He's gonna fall into the temptation of trying to use brute force. He's gonna fall into temptation of denying Jesus even though he said he would die for him. What about you and me? Too many of us oftentimes are not understanding what it means to watch and to pray. The reason that we watch is so it informs how we pray. The reason that we pray is so that we're not overwhelmed with what we watch. And notice it says watch and pray, not watch and complain. Some of us need that reminder today. Because too often in our lives, we are a watch and complain society. As people of God, we're a watch and complain people, not a watch and pray people. So we watch what happens in the world, whether that's politically or socially or whatever, and we watch and complain instead of watch and pray. And turn to a father who can be trusted and turn to a father who knows what he's doing and ask him to intercede in that regard. And then the last thing that we see about the king's prayer is that it's a persevering prayer. Look in verse 39. It says, once more, Jesus went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to say. And returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the son of man is delivered into the hands of of sitters. So Jesus went away three times to pray. Three times. And what does the scripture remind us that he prayed? Same thing. He was praying what we have documented here. Everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me, but not what I will, but what you will. This is what he continues to pray. And he perseveres in his praying. You see, Mark tries to remind us that there are multiple times, even in in the book of Mark, Mark actually shows us three different times where Jesus is kind of alone in a time of prayer. This is one. 
But there are two others. The one is in the very first chapter in Mark chapter one. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus said, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then it also uh, gives us an indication of Jesus praying alone in Mark 6. It says, after leaving the disciples, he went up on a mountainside to pray, and that night the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake, and he was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And some of the other gospel writers give us an indication that there was, in the Greek language, that there was demonic activity in the terms of the tempest and the wind and the waves. So it's interesting that those two instances and this instance in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark points out as Jesus praying all alone. And there are three common characteristics of all three of those events. Jesus was alone, it was dark, And he was aware of the demonic in all three of those events. He was alone, it was dark, and he was aware of the demonic. Do you know why you need to persevere in prayer? Because you are going to face many a time in your life where you feel like you are alone, you are in the dark, and that you are being buffeted by Satan and his schemes. And you need to continue to persevere in prayer because here's the good news. You are not alone. You are never alone. Your Father who loves you is with you. Your King Jesus, who is your great high priest, is interceding for you. You are never alone, but you are going to face times where you need to persevere in prayer. The reason that we oftentimes feel that our needs can be best met elsewhere other than Jesus is because we do not persevere in prayer. Plain and simple. The reason that we find ourselves being a people that feels entitled is because we don't persevere in prayer. The reason that we have difficulty with humility in our own lives and pride overtakes us, and listen, I'm talking to you as somebody who I, I, know, the, I know the feeling in my own heart where pride grabs hold of you and doesn't want to let go of you. And you feel wronged or mad and you don't want to say you're sorry and you don't want to forgive and you don't want to do all of those things. And it feels better, so to speak, to our flesh to hang on to that. But if we will persevere in prayer, it is amazing the humility that comes out of that moment. And we stop holding grudges and we stop being embittered because we persevere in prayer. We prostrate ourselves before our Father and we find ourselves praying Humble, scripture-soaked, watchful, persevering prayers. And you know what the outcome of that is? We get a description of it from the writer of Hebrews. Listen to how he described, which really settles easily with this event. He says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect or complete or mature, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Do you know what the outcome was, ladies and gentlemen? The outcome of Jesus praying a humble, scripture-soaked, watchful, persevering prayer in the garden. Do you know what the outcome was? Obedience. That's what it was. So do you you want to know what it's like to pray like a king? Here it is. Pray to obey. That's what it's like to pray like a king. You pray to obey. You see, we do not pray to get our own way We pray to obey. We do not pray to somehow try and change God. We pray to obey. 
We do not pray so that everything will go smoothly and we'll get the front parking space at the mall and all of that stuff. We pray to obey. We do not pray because it's some kind of formula for blessing. We pray to obey. If you want to pray like a king in the most pressure-packed moments, you are praying to obey. Look at your life. If your life is not marked by obedience, it is likely because your life is marked by prayerlessness. Pray to obey. That is what the king did. When we get an opportunity to look at how the king spoke and prayed like a king in his most pressure-packed moment, he prayed to obey. And that's our responsibility. That's our job. We pray to obey. So let me say this to you. The struggle sometimes in our obedience is our unwillingness to prostrate ourselves before the Father, to put our faces and our hearts in the revelation of who he is in his word, to be ever mindful of what is going on around us, including the schemes of the enemy, and to persevere in that so that we can hear the voice of God and do what he says. And listen, even if it's difficult, as I said before, even if the cup is bitter, it's better because it's the Father. This is what he entrusts to us. So I say this to you. Pray to obey. This is what we see from the king. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Before we're dismissed, I want to remind you that the reason the gospel is such good news is because the king himself obeyed to the end. He obeyed to the shedding of his own blood. That's why the scripture reminds us, the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. But Jesus did. He obeyed to the end. He shed his own blood. He surrendered his will to the Father for you so that you could be reconciled to God. That even though we are sinners and even though we fail and even though we could never, ever, ever impress God, even though we never deserve to enter into God's presence based on our fallenness, our brokenness, our sinfulness, Jesus has made a way for us in his perfection, in his sacrifice, in his willingness to surrender his will to the Father and be our redemption, to be sin's offering. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave and so that you and I could know that his sacrifice was enough, that if we put our faith and our trust in him, we can be reconciled to the Father. And if you're here and you've never before come to a place where you have put your trust in Jesus... He is a good king, a king that has gone to a cross on your behalf, willingly, joyfully, so that you might know what it means to be reconciled to the Father. And if you want to know what that looks like, I want to encourage you, if you're here or in the East Worship Center, when we dismiss in a moment, I want you to come by the fireside room. I want you to speak to one of our pastors, one of our prayer partners, and just tell them, I, I need to know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to know what it means to have my sins forgiven and to find new life in him. I encourage you, I implore you, in Jesus' name, don't leave the building. Don't leave the building without settling that issue. 
for the remainder of us that know Jesus, my question is this. Would we be known by our obedience? Is our obedience obvious to the world that we live in? Are we obeying Jesus? Because ultimately, that's what the king did. He obeyed the father. And now we are implored to obey King Jesus. He has shown himself to be faithful, and he is faithful to us. And so whatever he calls us to, whatever he asks of us, some of us think, man, it's hard, man. It's difficult being a student when, you know, the people around me, they're going crazy. They're doing their thing. You know, they seem like they're having fun and they're cool and they're popular and blah, blah, blah. And it's difficult to be different than that. Yeah, it might be. It's difficult, man, in my place of work. You don't know what it's like in my place where I work. The people that I work with and the things that they say and what they do, man, to obey Jesus in that kind of environment, it's tough, Jerry. It's, it's not easy. I, I, I know. It's not. But it's better. Because he's always right. Jesus is always right. And he's always faithful. And he always wants to use us. And it may not be easy but I would suggest to you that if obedience is a struggle, then probably prayer is. Because King Jesus laid himself before his father and persevered in prayer. So Father, I ask that you'd allow us to be that same kind of people and that we would learn what it means to pray to obey. Not just to pray as some kind of religious exercise, not to pray because we thank God that it's some kind of a special incantation that we are offering. And if we do it enough times that you'll have to hear us or that you'll have to do what we tell you. Not not so that we can make you do what we want you to do. Not as some formula we think that equals blessing for us, but God, so that we will learn what it means to obey. That we will pray to obey. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, that we will obey you. Because you want us completely and totally surrender to you, God, that you might demonstrate your glory through us. So would you teach us, by the power of your spirit, would you write on our hearts that just as it was with our teacher, our king, the Lord Jesus, so it is to be with us. Because you, Lord Jesus, live in us and desire to live your life out through us. So obedience is not something that we just have to conjure up in our own strength. Obedience flows out of your life in us. God, may we allow that life to flow out of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.